Our scripture reading for this morning is found in the book of Numbers, chapter 9, verses 1 through 14. The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Let the Israelites keep the Passover at its appointed time. On the fourteenth day of this month at twilight, you shall keep it at its appointed time. According to all the statutes and all its regulations, you shall keep it. So Moses told the Israelites that they should keep the Passover. They kept the Passover in the first month on the fourteenth day of the month at twilight in the wilderness of Sinai, just as the Lord had commanded. Moses, so the Israelites did. Now there were certain people who were unclean through touching a corpse so that they could not keep the Passover on that day. They came before Moses and Aaron on that day and said to him, Although we are unclean through touching a corpse, why must we be kept from presenting the Lord's offering at its appointed time among the Israelites? Moses said to them, Wait, so that I may hear what the Lord will command concerning you. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the Israelites, saying, any one of you or your descendants who is unclean through touching a corpse or is away on a journey shall still keep the Passover to the Lord. In the second month, on the fourteenth day at twilight, they shall keep it. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none until morning, nor break a bone of it. According to all the statute of the Passover shall they keep it. But anyone who is clean and is not on a journey and yet refrains from keeping the Passover shall be cut off from the people for not presenting the Lord's offering at an appointed time, such as the one shall bear the consequences of sin. Any ailing, alien residing among you who wishes to keep this Passover to the Lord shall do so according to the statute of the Passover and according to its regulations. You shall have one statute of both the resident alien and the native." May God add a blessing on the reading of his words today. Would you all pray with me, please? Loving God, in this hour and in this place, I ask that you grant to me the gift of preaching. That the meditation of my mouth and the words of my my heart bring glory unto you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. And to the beloved who are gathered in this house today, I ask that you grant to them the gift of hearing. That in our time in which we sit and meditate on your word, we grow closer to each other closer to you, and stronger in our service to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes, as westernized Christian Americans, we have a really difficult time at understanding the rites and statutes of an old, ancient religion. That is not just something that we can choose to partake in because we have a separation of church and state, but something that is also the defining element of their culture. Israelites were not just a nation of people. They were a nation of people. They were a culture that was rooted out of one person they could trace their lineage back to who had been promised by God that they would be a nation. Can any of us say that in our family background? We immediately have a disconnect. But the amazing thing that's going on in this passage is the Israelites have been freed out of their bondage of Egypt for a period of about two years. They first left Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, and went to enter the Promised Land, thinking that they were ready, but they weren't. Instead, God said no, because there was doubt that was bred among the people. You see, they had sent spies into the promised land to check it out, what we would call on the map the land of Canaan, today modern-day Palestine or Israel. And what had happened was is the spies went in and they saw what they called were giants, people who were bigger and stronger than they were. They were living in fortified towns, fortresses almost, if you will. They knew how to organize, they knew how to take care of themselves, and they basically looked like folks you didn't want to mess with on a good day. The majority of the spies came running back saying, we can't go there, God's out of his gourd. But two came back carrying a huge bundle of grapes, a large, luscious bundle bigger than anything that they'd seen. Now, usually one man can carry a bundle. This was large enough for two, and they had it suspended on a pole between their shoulders as they walked in single file, more of a trot, if you understand the scriptures in the original Hebrew. 
And when they came back, they said, look at what God is going to give us. But by then, the doubt had crept through the people, and they went, um, no. Joshua and Caleb were the two men who said, come on, we can do this. Come on, God will provide. God will take us forward. And the rest of the population went, um, no. Now, here's the sticky wicket that we don't necessarily like. Out of that whole generation of people who had been freed from slavery out of Egypt, only two entered the promised land, Joshua and Caleb. Because those are the only two that declared their faith, come on, God can make this happen. So the Israelites got put into the wilderness. Now, a lot of times when we think about wilderness wanderings, we think about like a Bedouin people who are constantly on the move. What wandering means biblically is you don't have a centralized, established home. You are a nomad. Your home is where you have pitched your tent in that moment. And maybe that moment can be a day, a week, a month, a couple of years. Keep in mind, this is a whole population of people. They had Industry that was going with them, they had smith workers. They had shepherds with sheep and goats and other animals. And they had farmers who would try to grow and sow crops. But they couldn't always do that, which their moving was very slow. Two years they have been, quote-unquote, wandering. And at this point, it's generally believed that they had been encamped at the base of Mount Sinai, broken down into the various tribes which were named after the various brothers of Jacob, whose name became Israel. The Reubenites lived here. The Benjamites lived there. The, the Issachars were here and all over the place. And they all had assigned duties and specialties that they were supposed to do. So for two years, they went along, they went along with life as they knew it. Get up, crank the kids out of their beds, have some breakfast, go to work, Go about your chores, come home, wash up, have dinner, get up and do it again. Day after day after day. Kind of like our routines that we have. And all this time, they're waiting. God, you have promised us a place that will be ours. So there'll be moments of excitement. But after two years... There might be a little doubt. There might be a little question. There might be a wee bit of impatience starting to creep up. So God does an amazing thing. He talks to Moses and says, remind them of why they're here. Celebrate the Passover. In other words, remember the act that I performed that allowed you to be free. This sparked excitement. And people who were becoming ho-hum in their faith and dedication to God were now excited because they immediately obeyed. There is no question in numbers. There is no doubt. There is no hesitation. They're like, when? Let's get ready. Let's do it. God did an amazing thing. Let's celebrate it and remember. Let's get behind it even the people whom the society would outcast. Because according to the extensions of the law, if you touched anything unclean and rendered yourself unclean, you could not come close to the people celebrating a festival to God. You couldn't even enter a holy city. Can you imagine having a disease or a sickness and being told, because you have this, you can't come and worship with your friends? You can't be part of your family. Don't even think of going out into the community. You need to stay away, stay out. You are not welcome because you are not pure, ritually. These people who had been unclean, and it said, by a corpse. So they were dealing with the dead. Keep in mind, two years wandering in the wilderness... Babies have been born. New marriages have started. Elders have passed. 
Someone has to deal with them. And it is considered an unclean profession to deal with the dead. They wanted to be included. They had a profession that their society was dependent upon, but their society cast them out because of what it made them do. And they said, we want to be part of the celebration. We want to sit at God's table. Moses, Aaron, Moses, the leader of the people, Aaron, the spiritual priest, the one who conducted the services on behalf of the people. Is this at all possible? And instead of Moses just falling back and protecting himself and just reflecting the law back to them and saying, oh, wholehearted, um, no, he said, let me talk to God about that. So he goes and talks to God. And God said, of course I want them at the table. At the time and the place that I've told you, make room. Even those who are alien, and in this case, an alien is anyone who was not born and raised an Israelite. You could be a convert to the Jewish faith, but in the eyes of the ancient Jews and some of the more conservative Jews today, even if you convert to Judaism, you're not a real Jew because you weren't born and raised a Jew. You can't trace your family history back to the line of Moses, to, to, to David's time, to, to, to Abraham's time. You can't do that. So, yeah, you can be part of us, but you're not really one of us. That was an alien, which meant there were Egyptians who had converted to the worship of Yahweh, to the Israelite faith, and came with them. They wanted to be included at the table. And God said, everyone. Everyone is welcome to come and celebrate. Everyone is welcome to come and be part of me. Everyone is welcome to come and be together as a people of God. Don't keep them separate because of things that you think should separate you. I want them all to come unto me. Now, this is all happening in the wilderness. This is all happening while they're waiting for God to interact. In the doldrums and the routines of their daily lives, I don't know, have you ever had days and weeks where you've just been caught up in all the stuff that you get to do and you forget that God is there? Or you're waiting for really important news, heavy news, and you're like, God, when are you going to move fast enough on this for me? My mother gave me a poster years ago when I was a young child. It had the picture of a monk standing on a hill in a very saintly position looking up to the heavens saying, Lord, give me the patience on the top of it. And on the bottom it said, and I want it right now. Why are you turning red? (laughs) We have a difficulty sometimes in recognizing God among us when we're in the wilderness of our routines. And when we are awakened to it, we think that, oh, that should just be for me and my people. Those who I deem should be acceptable to come and be part of the body. But God is clearly saying, I am there with you always. And when I emerge myself to you and say, come and be part of this, invite everybody. Not just who you believe is appropriate. You believe is clean. You who would want to sit next to you. Invite the broken Invite the sick. Invite the smelly. Invite those who are completely different from you. They deserve a place at my table. They deserve to be part of the family as well. And that happens in the wilderness for ourselves. When we least expect it. When we're uncertain as to where we're going and what we should be doing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, how we should be relating to each other, especially in a time like this, when you're in a transition period, oh God, what's next? God is still here. Moving, planning, growing, guiding, and inviting The wilderness time isn't a time to cinch up your pants, pull up your bootstraps, and hide in a hole and just wait for the next thing to come along. It's time to explore. It's a time to grow. 
It's a time to imagine. It's a time to get outside of the box. It's a time to be interrupted to the amazing things that God can do that may be outside of the purview of what you're either A, accustomed to, or B, you have programmed yourself to expect from God. When God is with you in the wilderness, expect to be surprised. You see, I think those unclean people that went and said, can we be included? I think they were surprised when Moses went, let me talk to God. He didn't decide. He listened to God's decision. And then they were equally surprised when God went, of course I want them there. They are part of my creation. They are made in my image. Put them in my presence. Put them in the celebration. Put them in this place where all of us can be one together and close to me. That's what being in a relationship with God is about. Being close to God. Not on our own individually, but as an interwoven, unique, diverse body. They're talking about that here in Numbers at the base of Mount Sinai, when they were going from being a people who were broken, who knew how to be slaves, learning how to be a nation of God's people, getting prepared to enter a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, lush providence that would blow their minds. If God did that for the Jews at Sinai, What will God do for us through the gift of his son? How will he provide? How will he challenge? How will he grow? How will he humble? How will he educate? How will he build up? So we can sit there and not have our faith all unto ourselves, but be comfortable with living and sharing it with each other and amongst strangers. So they can be part of the body as well. My answer to that is when you're in the wilderness, wandering in your pilgrimage, just remember that God is there. God is the one guiding you. God is the one helping you make wise choices. God is the one who is telling you to step this way and not that. God is the one urging you to the person who looks like they're hurting and needs a friendly voice. God is the one sometimes saying, step back and wait. They're not ready for you to approach yet. But God is always the one saying, I love you. I sent my son because I want to be with you and the rest of the world. So as you wander in the wilderness, remember like the Israelites of old, God is with us and wants to be with us. Will you pray with me, please? Amazing God, who puts us in a position to move. Move not merely with our bodies, but with our minds, our prejudices, our preconceptions. Move in our relationships to expand and grow it to others. Move in our openness to embrace diversity Move, O God, in your spirit as one body with many members, but together can be a powerful, integral element of sharing your love in this world. Help us, O God, to come together and work towards the common goal that you put before us, the goal of being one with you, the goal of serving you, the goal of sharing you with both friends and strangers in this world you have put in our care. We thank you for that. In your son's precious and holy name. Amen.